from the National Park Service, Northeast Temperate Inventory and Monitoring Network in Woodstock, Vermont. Aaron is going to be presenting forest health monitoring in Northeastern National Parks. <coughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, I actually noticed that on the uh, uh, schedule here, it says that I'm going to be talking about land bird monitoring. Well, actually, you'd be very unhappy to hear that I won't be talking really about birds at all. I may mention the word bird twice, uh, but I am going to be talking about forest health monitoring because that's what this session is. So I think that it was just a little bit of a snafu with the program. Um, anyway, uh, I, before I guess I start out here, does it, is how, just by a quick show of hands, does anybody know about the inventory and monitoring program in the National Park Service? One person. Okay, I would say that that is a really good reason for me to give a little bit of um, talk about that. So I will cover that in the first section of the talk where I'm going to talk a little bit about the mission of the Park Service um, and some of our management focus. I am going to get in kind of the nuts and bolts of what we do for monitoring uh, forest condition and then talk a little bit about translating these results into forest monitoring. Um, so a little bit of the beginning of this is an intro about what we do. Uh, I'm not going to be able to have a ton of time to talk about some of the recent science outputs. I'll kind of gloss over that, but I really just want to present the fact that we are collecting some valuable forest data. We have a very unique management perspective within the Park Service, and that I think that these data in general can contribute to some of these more regional efforts, um, you know, across the region. And I'm certainly looking for more and more collaborators on this. Um, I also want to acknowledge the... Um, uh, the vast amount of this work is all done by Dr. Kate Miller, who just got her PhD at the University of Maine. Um, she started in this program uh, back in 2004, 2005 as a technician, has basically now led the program into collecting this data. Um, she's excellent at doing all sorts of, you know, doing the high quality. She's now been doing the quantitative analysis, which I'll talk about. Um, and so really hats off to her. And if I misspeak on anything, it's not because of her. What she said, is that's all on me. Um, and then I just want to acknowledge Camilla Serap, who who's our forest crew leader. Um, I'll talk a little about this more in detail, but she basically leads our crews across the entire uh, East Coast, or at least the northeastern part of it. Um, uh, amongst uh, all a traveling forest crew, which over the years, I think since 2007 or so, has been at least 50 or so monitors. So I really want to provide hats off to all these folks and, and uh, getting us to where we are today. So just uh, briefly, the Park Service mission, um, a lot of people I hope that are familiar with this, but I think that the underlying uh, component of this is that we are maintaining these conditions within our parks, cultural and natural resources, um, for you know, unimpaired into the future. Um, a lot of people think about national parks as Acadia, or Yellowstone, these big, what we call natural resource parks. We actually manage a whole bunch of other historic sites, which are really focused on the cultural resource aspects. And my office is based at Marsh Billings. Uh, Rockefeller in Woodstock, Vermont, um, uh, you know, which is a cultural resource sort of based, um, you know, uh, commemorating the families that were there. One of the things that all of these parks do have in common and that my program oversees is that all of the natural resources within these, they all have very significant natural resources that need protection. And just a real quick rundown, the Inventory and Monitoring Division, which was put in place through a congressional mandate back in the late 90s, basically conducts long-term natural resource inventory and monitoring within these parks. Uh, we have 32 of these networks, these eco-regional networks. Uh, the, my program is the Northeast Temperate Network that's based out of Acadia National Park and Woodstock, uh, Vermont. I'm not going to go over all of these, but basically there are about 270 park units that are involved in this, uh, we call it the I program and we're there to basically um, bolster the science uh, within these parks to, to uh, influence decision making. Um, I would also argue that it's also important that our data are integrated into education and other interpretive uh, components of the park programs as well. Uh, my program in particular oversees natural resource monitoring within uh, these 13 parks. Um, not all of these do we, that, that, that we have for is vegetation monitoring. Uh, here's the list of sort of the things that we, we do. Um, I said really quickly, I'm based here in uh, Woodstock, you know, we're up somewhere here. We have the Appalachian Trail, uh, Acadia National Park, and a number of other historic sites within this area. Again, they all have very significant natural resources that our park managers need to care about because actually a lot of our natural resources affect the cultural uh, resources in those sites. So now kind of getting on to what we do in terms of uh, forest condition, uh, we have a long-term monitoring forest health protocol, a very um, similar sort of plot design as like an FIA kind of base design. 
Um, the, you can see the general objectives are there, was are looking at estimating changes in forest structure and, and sort of dynamics over time. The idea here is that uh, if we start to see changes in those, then we can report those to parks and then understand whether or not those changes are a world of, res uh, of stressors and whether there's anything that we can do about them. Um, the other thing that associated with this protocol is that we also, we can link this with results of our other long-term monitoring. So concurrent with our forest uh, vegetation monitoring is we have land bird monitoring and water monitoring as well. And so we take a real sort of ecosystem approach to understanding what's happening within these parks. Um, this is our plot design, which varies anywhere from 15 meters squared to 20 meters squared. Um, you know, we're collecting things uh, like uh, tree DBH, uh, looking at growth rates over time at sort of the plot scale. We have microplots where we look at shrub uh, abundance, um, sapling recruitment, and then we have these quadrats uh, that we look at uh, understory, uh, particularly regeneration layers and other uh, forbs. Um, the monitoring the started annually in, in 2007. Um, I'm going to show you what the design sort of looks like. This is a Marsh Billings uh, Rockefeller in Woodstock. These are these green locations are where our plots are. This is sort of a uh, random, you know, spatially balanced uh, grits uh, design. Uh, the number of plots that we have in each of our parks is proportional to the forest area within those parks. Um, and uh, in addition to some of the basic, uh, yeah, go ahead. Are they permanent? Yeah. These are, these are long-term permanent plots, right. Um, we, we visit these in sort of a rotating panel design. So each of the plots themselves gets monitored every four years, uh, but a subset of the plots in each park gets monitored every two years. Uh, but in addition to sort of the, t the tree demographic sort of data, vegetation data, as we do take uh, soils data, we look at uh, deer browse, and we also collect data on coarse woody debris volume in our plots as well. Uh, the other forest monitoring program that we do is along the Appalachian Trail. Um, the Appalachian Trail, the Park Service manages about a thousand feet on both sides of the actual main trail. Uh, but we actually look at summary, uh, summarizing the, um, the forest dynamics at a greater ecological scale. And so uh, this line is the a AT itself, and then this is what we call the Huck 10 shell at which we collate uh, and summarize our forest health data. Um, in the beginning, we sort of played with the idea of, of using some more plot-based things that MPS would actually fund, but we've actually moved towards leveraging some of the work by FIA and using their plot data. Uh, that, you know, it's, it's convenient also because we don't have to fund the collection of it, but we can then summarize and take advantage of some of their data systems to then summarize the forest uh, health data uh, within the different uh, ecological subsections. And this, uh, we know, is, has been used and will continue to be really important in some of the large landscape initiatives surrounding sort of the AT and other conservation um, initiatives with the Appalachian Trail. Um, the program manager of this is Fred Diefenbach. He works with me. I encourage you to reach out with him. We have a number of summaries um, that are uh, online currently. Uh, this is an evolving program because FIA sort of changed some of the, uh, the background data management on us. So we are kind of uh, reintroducing a new summary workflow. But if you have questions or interest in the data, just please let me know. Um, the last uh, bit that I just want to point out is that uh, across the entire nation I showed you, there are 32 networks that are managing natural resource monitoring. Um, the eastern networks, the northeastern networks in particular, are very cohesive in that we all do forest monitoring and we all do very similar versions of forest monitoring. Um, and so this is just to let you know that among these, uh, these different colors are the different networks, a handful of networks. Uh, there are 39 parks that we have long-term forest monitoring in. Uh, across these. We have about 2,000 uh, long-term plots. So there's a great deal of information here. Um, lots of variability across these parks and the management and the forest types that we can begin asking some interesting questions. And all of these data have been collected since 2007. And I'll get back to this figure in a little bit to talk about some of the collaborative science we've been doing. Um, so uh, the, I guess the next important thing is, is I don't have a ton of time to go into all the nitty gritty details of, the de uh, of what we've been finding, but I just wanted to kind of introduce some of the products that we have that are on our website and how we interact with some of our managers and what they're using for decision making. 
Um, so uh, these are the nine or so parks. Uh, Roosevelt Vanderbilt is a complex of a couple of parks that we do long-term monitoring in. Um, in general, our main threats to these forest parks include, you know, not all that different to what we're seeing regionally. Uh, you know, invasive plants, invasive forest pests. Uh, deer overabundance seems to be particularly important. And then uh, with interactions and lacking, uh, with effects on lacking and, you know, suboptimal regeneration. So I'm just going to kind of go over that in a little bit. Um, uh, some recent work that Kate's putting together that is in, in sort of in process um, is looking at changes in trends in invasive cover over time. Invasive plant species tend to eat sort of our, the lunch of our resource managers. They spend a lot of time with this. What you can say, see pretty quickly um, is that this is actually the change over time, the cycle being sort of uh, into these bundles uh, broken down by different guilds. Uh, you can see pretty much right away that we have quite a bit of variability among our park units and I apologize that these are our four letter acronyms, um, Acadia, Marsh Billings, this is Minuteman, Morristown, uh, New Jersey, Roosevelt, Vanderbilt, St. Gaudens in New Hampshire, Saratoga, National Historic Park in New York, and then this is Weir Farm in Connecticut. Um, you can see that there's variability in the, in the trends of these. Can I take your questions after? Would that be okay? Um, what what we are what some of the most uh, and and so some of these trends are also a reflection on the uh, a bit of sort of uh, the resource uh, management that's happened in the park in the past, um, but something that's worrying us a lot are the changes that we're seeing in the in the invasive shrub uh, cover uh, within our plots. Um, and this is just an example of how we've been representing some of these data to our, our resource managers. And this is an example of an invasive shrub cover uh, in Saratoga National Historic Park, which basically gives you a sense of the relative cover of the invasive shrubs across the park. Um, and so that this kind of, we hope that this is going to be able to influence kind of boots on the ground management. Um, and this is just some common buckthorn, I guess, uh, shrub that's there. Um, you know, our, our park, we worked with our parks to develop these kinds of graphics and we try to continually work with them to better understand what their needs are and what they can use for their decision making. Um, lack of regeneration was another thing that I br uh, brought up um, as, as important within our parks and this is uh, in the home of uh, FDR uh, in the Hudson River Valley. Um, there's just nothing growing on the ground um, and we have, a, I mean, you can see the legacy of deer impacts in here for sure. Uh, this park also has uh, issues with hemlock willy adelgid and some other stresses as well. But across the network itself we see that there's quite a variability uh, in the lack of or the pro issues that we have with regeneration. Whereas, you know, Acadia, we have actually sufficient stocking, and this is that sort of Williams index of, of stocking that weights sort of the different, the abundance and the sizes of your regeneration. Um, but what we're generally seeing the trends are that our southern New England parks and our, our New York and New Jersey parks tend to have more issues, okay, uh, of, or regeneration uh, debts. And we think that a lot of this is linked to legacy effects of, of deer um, browsing and potentially some competition or some impacts from invasive plant species. And this is just another depiction of how we represent that to our resource managers. Again, this is from Saratoga to show you the spatial variability that we're seeing in the amount of regeneration, which is indicated by the size of the pie charts and then the composition of that. And one of the things that I just want to point out quickly is that there are some parks and, uh, parks and some parts of parks where we're actually seeing really sufficient regeneration. But one of the trend that we're seeing in Gettysburg, a handful of other Pennsylvania parks, and now sort of in some of our uh, Mid-Atlantic, other Mid-Atlantic parks is a huge flush of white ash regeneration, which is obviously concerning because we do have emerald ash borer confirmed in this park, and so is this really a resilient forest type in the future? Um, and then I just want to quickly kind of follow up on these regional science projects, and I don't have a lot to, to, to share. I don't have a lot of time to share what was going on here. But basically, Kate has been taking a lot of our plot data within our parks and comparing it to these quote-unquote matrix uh, 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 areas around them, which is basically uh, the FIA data. Uh, and in a sense, it's comparing uh, the Park Service sort of leave it to natural process management compared to more sort of harvesting and other kinds of silvicultural management. But we're basically seeing that parks are really harboring a higher structural diversity, older mature forest structure, which obviously makes a lot of sense because we're letting these forests mature versus going and doing a lot of harvesting of, of the big material. Um, 
you know, we also tend to find much more coarse woody debris within these parks than, than sort of the surrounding matrix. Um, and Nick Fizzichelli, who's also at this meeting, has been looking at using some of our data to look at interactions between stressors, okay, thanks, and how those are in, in promoting and warming, so climate change is in, in uh, promoting non-native plant species. I encourage you to kind of check out some of these pubs or get into touch with me to, to get them if you'd like some further details. I think the point is, is that th these, that these um, and I'm just going to kind of summarize this in a few words here, is that um, we're finding through the INM uh, program that our part that our data is not only really valuable to the Park Service in terms of management and decision making. I think it's actually really important that we can also provide our our, our context or our management lens and provide that to a greater network of data. And, and one of the reasons why I wanted to present here today, uh, we have a really unique perspective on things. I think the science that we've been doing has been really reflective on that the parks are actually maintaining lots of really unique forest structure. Um, and then there could be some interactions and some resiliency to climate that we might find in parks that is a little bit different than some of these other areas, given the unique forest structure that we have. Um, you know, when you have sort of a mature forest that's surrounded by, you know, a sea of sort of varying land use and that's protected, um, that, there's something potentially valuable there. Thanks. Um, and I, I guess I, I'll just kind of wrap that up and say that you guys have heard everything from the morning sessions about the effects of climate change. We are working with some of our partners on what do we do about adaptation in some of these parks with climate change in our forests. Uh, Marsh Billings Rockefeller is kind of our outlier in the Park Service where they actually do active silviculture. And I know that T Tony D'Amato and Nick, Nick Fisichelli and other people are working to try to kind of use the Marsh Billings as a model to identify how adaptation can go in the future. Okay, with that, I will uh, say if you need to contact us, go, uh, you know, go to that website. We have a data manager. We're always interested in entertaining data requests. And check out our poster if you get a chance. Thanks. Yeah, sure. How do you deal with uh, uh, parks? You guys uh, sometimes conduct is the rehabilitation to uh, some of the park sites to try to bring it back to you know, yeah. getting what it looked like back in the day. Right. Um, how does that impact your the studies of those uh, particular parks when you're dealing with the modern? Uh, sure. So um, all of our forest monitoring plots are currently set within sort of forest, you know, stands. Um, so in Gettysburg, which is really trying to manage for like an early succession, we have forest plots there that another network manages, uh, but they're not in areas that they actively manage to be uh, a, a field, for example. Uh, Saratoga actually just recently had one of these micro bursts where it actually took a forest and turned it into maybe a potentially early successional habitat. In that case, we sit back and watch and see what happens. Um, the other lens of that is uh, we tell our park managers that if you need to do treatments um, that we want to be able we want to know that you're doing treatments and where you're doing them and and in some level we don't care if they're spraying some of our plots we just need to know that so again part of our our, our task is to try to understand the underlying changes over time but we as a, a land management agency we need to start if we can evaluate management effects uh, then we'll definitely uh, do that um, I guess I'll also speak to a a little bit of, you know, what we're trying to really do and identify with our data is what are the best ways to keep a forest stand there? Not is it, you know, oak hickory stand that was thin back in the Gettysburg era or whatever. We're trying to understand what, how are ways that we can keep resilient forest cover um, that would then have potentially other effects on the cultural resources. And, and that's where some of the adaptation work that Nick and others are going to do that's going to be really helpful to see that the character of marsh buildings, which uh, Rockefeller and Woodstock, which, you know, is a classic North Northern hardwood forest mixed with all sorts of plantations. Well, over time, that's progressively probably going to, given our understanding of projections, turn to a more oak-dominated, you know, system. Um, how fast that's going to happen, we don't really know. And and are we going to have to do more proactive management, like actually purposeful seeding and planting to get there? We're not really sure. But those are all things that I think that are you know on our mind and so forth. Yeah, we'll do that. data that you work with day to day, um, but if you could talk at all about whether you're seeing um, abundance and diversity of those invasive shrub species uh, greater in some of those more southern parts and the, the temperate network, 
or is it more driven by the historic land use of the parks that the system has? Yeah, so there's definitely a trajectory for more of our southerly parks that are having uh, more, you know, influences by invasive species. Part of that is definitely um, just the historic kind of land use that's around them and what they're at. All, it's also a reflection on the management that's going on with those parks. I think particularly the propagule pressure down in those southerly parks are uh, definitely, um, you know, it's, it's stronger. The other thing is, and as I mentioned, one of the trends is to seeing more and more deer presence in the legacy effects of deer, and, and we know that there's interactions there as well. Great question. Thanks.